Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And we are very excited about the guest that we have on today. We have Dr. Aaron Stiles with us. How are you this morning? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, our viewers and listeners are going to love this episode, and I guarantee we'll be able to relate completely to this episode. Why don't we start out, Landon, um, by reading Aaron's bio, and then we'll kind of describe how we even came across this topic and decided to reach out to Aaron. Yeah, this is a, a short bio, but she'll go on to expound some of the other things that she does. But Aaron Stiles is a professor of anthropology at the University of Nevada, Reno. Until launching the project on spirits in Utah, her research focused entirely on the intersections of Islam and law in Zanzibar, Tanzania, and East Africa. So, an anthropologist. <laughs> That's right. A religious anthropologist. This is fascinating. So, um, we were perusing the news, as we often do here on Mormonish, and we came across an article in the Salt Lake Tribune that was called, Angelic and Demonic Visitors Are Just Part of What It Means to Be a Latter-day Saint. Which, of course, Landon and I both completely agree with. <laughs> and this is an article um, by Tamara Kemsley, and it talked about a new book coming out next month called The Devil Sat on My Bed, Encounters with the Spirit World in Mormon, Utah. And we instantly thought, oh, this is a topic that we would love to delve into. So we contacted Erin, and she was so nice, just very spur of the moment, very quickly to agree to come on. So welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me here. It's an honor. Yeah. And now you mentioned in the article that you did grow up in Utah, although we're not a Mormon. So why don't you talk a little bit about just Utah and growing up and how that informed you eventually being interested enough to write about this topic, which is so fascinating. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I grew up in Cache Valley, um, at just in a town called Providence, just south of Logan. Uh, we moved there when I was about five. My dad was a professor at Utah State University, and we moved from New Mexico So for his job. And so I spent my whole life there. My mom still lives there in the same house I grew up in. My dad passed away a few years ago. Um, but yeah, I was. we were not Latter-day Saint. Um, we were probably the only people in our neighborhood who weren't. I think our <laughs> next-door neighbors were Jack Mormons, but we were certainly the only Episcopalians. So yeah, so I think that was, I, I mean, I don't really remember exactly how our parents described moving to, to Utah from New Mexico, but it was, you know, it was clear right away as kids that, oh, we're, you know, we're, we're part of the community here and we're part of the culture, but we're not in other ways. You know, we go to a different church, um, lots, many, many differences between our family and other families in the neighborhood, but um, it was, you know, really wonderful place to grow up and absolutely love Cash Valley. So I think, yeah, so I think, but growing up, uh, I, you know, I had a couple of other non-Mormon friends here and there, but pretty much everybody we knew, of course, were members of the church. Um, and my mother would always say in response to that, oh, well, when she was asked, are you members of the church? She said, yes, yes, I am the Episcopal church. So anyway, you know, <laughs> what a great answer. Yes, because yes, it's assumed <laughs> <laughs> there's only one church. <laughs> absolutely. She has her, all of her stock answers there. But yeah, but I think because of that, you know, religion was all something we always talked about because, you know, friends always wanted to know about our religion, our church, and they'd ask, oh, well, what are you? And say Episcopalian, and they'd say, oh, Presbyterian. So I remember, I do remember that. It was a word that a lot of people hadn't heard. But so I grew up, I guess, with lots, having lots and lots of interesting conversations about religion frequently. And then when I went to college, um, yeah, I ended up studying, I kind of tacked back and forth between majoring in anthropology and majoring in religious studies. And then I ended up sticking with anthropology, though, with a focus on religion. Um, but the, yeah, the reason, I guess, the, yes, the reason I started this project or how I was interested in it, um, I, I did, I've done most of my research up until this project in Zanzibar, which is part of Tanzania and East Africa, studying, I do anthropology of Islam, and I study Islamic law and how how disputes are resolved in Islamic courts. Um, but about, you know, five or 10 years, ago, I guess about 10 years ago, um, when I come to University of Nevada, I, you know, got had married and started having kids, it was a lot harder for me to get to East Africa to do field work with a family. <laughs> and so I was looking for a project to do closer to home. And a good friend of mine and colleague, um, at another university, Liam Murphy, he asked me one day, he said, you know, you're from Utah. It's like, I'm doing this comparative project on conceptions of evil and different different religions. Like, what do you know about 
evil in Mormonism? And I said, I, I just said, not much, um, but that sparked a memory. And I remembered playing with friends, you know, as a kid. And then at so sometimes, a, a, you know, a friend would stop playing and she'd say, oh, guess what? The devil came in my room and sat on my bed last night. And we'd all say, okay. And then I remember, I mean, I remember this happening more than once. And I remember it was never anything that frightening. Um, and usually the devil had red eyes. And then the the friend would, and most, you know, most of the girl play, friends I played with were girls. So it was usually a girl. And, said, and then, you know, and then I went back to sleep and the devil went away. And it was, it was, so my, my friend, my colleague Liam's question sparked that memory of these devil stories. And so I, I thought, you know, I'm going to start looking into that. And I'd, um, I'd been, I'd, I was kind of thinking about a project that I could do in, in Cache Valley in particular, just because my parents were there and they could help me with childcare. My husband couldn't come with me. So I was like, oh, that'll be easy. And, you know, I've, I've always been interested. There's not a whole lot of anthropology, anthropological work done on Mormon communities in Utah or elsewhere. So it seemed to be an area where there was a lot there's a lot an anthropologist could look at. And so I'd, I'd actually start, I don't know how, I don't remember how this happened, but somehow I ended up in the wonderful folklore archive at Utah State University, um, the Fife Folklore Collection. And I'm not trained as a folklorist, so I really don't know how maybe a spirit guided me. I don't know, but somehow I ended up in the Fife Folklore Collection. And I was actually starting, wanting to start a project on gender and marriage in um, in Cache Valley among those who are raised Latter-day Saint and those who weren't. And I, so I was looking for, I was looking for material in the folklore collection relevant to kind of preparations for marriage and, and stories about marriage. And then I started thinking, well, you know, I'm going to look into these devil stories. And so I ended up finding um, a huge trove of these wonderful narratives collected by Utah State University students over, you know, the last 30, 40 years. Um, and so there was certainly, you know, there's a big folder, a few folders on devil experiences, but there are, a, a, and more on, you know, kind of with generic sort of evil spirits, and then lots and lots more stories about people's interactions with benevolent spirits. Um, and so there was such a treasure trove of wonderful narratives. And I started reading them, and I started remembering hearing these stories growing up. And so I kind of dropped the project on marriage, which I wasn't, I didn't really want to do. That's a good project, but I don't think I was the one to do that project. And so then I switched to researching these spirit experiences. And so I started in the folklore collection. And then as an anthropologist, what we do is we study religion and practice or religion as it is lived in everyday life. And so I then transitioned from working in the folklore collection to start do, to do, to starting to work with, with people. So, um, I reached out to a few people. I started with acquaintances, um, you know, people that I knew or friends I had just to ask if they thought, well, what do you think? I mean, I, I'm interested in this topic. I found all these wonderful narratives collected by students for the last few decades. What do you think about this as, you know, as a really substantial project? And of course, everybody I talked to said, oh, yeah, this happens all the time. You know, my grandma had this experience or I had this experience or my brother, when he was on a mission, had this crazy experience. And so then I started doing interviews. And so I started collecting um, narratives from people who'd actually had these experiences. And so that that's kind of how how the project developed. One of the um one of the well, when you when you read the book, one one of the um, one of the most fat. Oh, I mean, they're all fascinating. But one of the most interesting people I worked with was um, I call him Jake. So I change all the names for for pri for reasons of privacy. Um, and Jake was someone that I'd known for a long time, but hadn't really been in touch with. But I ran across one of his college papers in the Utah State University folklore collection, and I read this narrative about a particular experience. And I read who wrote it. I was like, oh, so-and-so so and so is a friend of mine from high school. So I actually reached, I hadn't been in touch with him for a few, few years, but I reached out to him maybe on Facebook or something at that point. And he was super excited about the project. And he's like, absolutely, let's talk tomorrow. So we sat down and he told me about the narrative that, you know, the experience he'd written about for this folklore class. But then he kind of, you know, and un he, just, he just kind of, kept going and telling me about all these other amazing experiences he'd had. So that was, that's kind of an example of how I ended up um, 
recruiting people, so to speak, kind of informally recruiting them for the project. It was through, it was really through, through, through connections I already had by virtue of growing up in Cache Valley and still having lots of friends there and family members. And then through kind of sometimes in, in anthropology and the social sciences, we call it snowball sampling where you, you know, you're looking to interview a particular type of person who's had this kind of experience. And so, you know, I interviewed Jake and then I say, Jake, who else do you think I should talk to? Who else do you think is knowledgeable about this particular area? Or who else has had these kinds of experience? So that's kind of how, that's kind of how the project developed. I, yeah, I have to say, that, oh, go ahead, Landon. Well, I, I was going to say, you're probably not the first person who started with marriage and went to devil in the bed. So, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good one, Landon. Oh, good one. You said it on me. <laughs> That's right. That's it. So, no, I was going to say that. Oh, my gosh, Landon. I was going to say that I'm guessing you didn't come across a single person that did not have some kind of experience to share. Because in Mormonism, there's a phrase, and I'm sure you came across it, the veil is thin, meaning that the other world is right there, either evil spirits or wonderful spirits. And and I'll just very quickly say the reason the article attracted me so is because I was very much raised in a spirit-saturated household. My parents were really into genealogy, and that meant communing and talking to dead ancestors that would point them into the right direction, even giving them page numbers in record books to look at, you know, stories like that. It was very real to me as a child. Um, I felt that my house was full of these ancestor spirits. Um, my mom would say, oh, don't sit on that chair great great grandmother was just sitting there i mean it was it was just kind of normal you know and she she was sort of directed by something that she called the voice it was not the holy ghost you know which mormons that's very standard this was something else either an ancestor or somebody that she would follow these instructions and I have one sister. We were both raised that way. That was just part of how we were, you know, we interacted with our parents. We went to a lot of cemeteries for genealogy. You know, I didn't think much about it until I grew up and had my own children, took my children home, you know, to hang out with grandma and she'd start this kind of talk. And they, being children in the 21st century, would look at me and go, mom, you know, and that's when I kind of realized, oh, this, <laughs> this may not be normal. So, but as you said, this was all in my household, benevolent. Yes. Um, interactions. And I love how you talk about that in, in the article and, and some of the blurbs that we've read for the book, that there's there's a difference. There's a certain type of spirit that tends to be benevolent. And maybe you could talk about that, the sure. the relation or the... Yeah. yeah. So that's that. I love your phrase, the spirit saturated household. I mean, that's just yeah. a beautiful, I wish I would have thought of that. It's just a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful phrase. And that's so exactly what I'm talking about, that this is a spirit saturated environment. And I do, I have a chapter called Where the Veil is Thin, actually. So, so yeah, so that's it. Yeah. So, so what, when I started this project, um, again, I remember these devil stories and that's what, that's what stuck with me. Um, and so that's what I started researching. And I, you know, I found most of it, most people's experiences aren't with the devil per se or Lucifer, but they're with minions, right? So evil spirits who are followers of, of Satan. But the vast majority of experiences with spirits are with benevolent spirits. So that's, and it's very, very clear. People always know, is it, is it, you know, am I being harassed by a malevolent spirit? Or is this the benevolent spirit of an ancestor or a future child coming to give me advice, help me with genealogy, etc.? So that's so so in the book, I so I divide the book is kind of I have a couple chapters on on two or three chapters on benevolent spirit experiences and then a couple chapters on on evil spirit experiences. Um, so but that's so even though, you know, I kind of have it balanced in terms of how many chapters address each, I do make it pretty clear that most experiences are exactly what you're talking about, Rebecca. They're experiences with benevolent kin, either, you know, either grandma or a more distant ancestor or somebody, you know, a lot of, a lot of stories, there are a lot of stories about baptizing for the dead and then being, you know, visited by the spirit of the, the grateful recipient of the baptism. So those are, those stories are quite common as well as are visits from future children. So I'm sure you're familiar with those stories as well when spirit children come to visit. So that's, very, very common as well. Um, future mothers or mothers or fathers who thought they were done having children or visited by the spirit of, yeah. you know, of of Meg or John, 
you know, coming and imploring, nope, you need to have one more kid. I'm here, I'm waiting. Yeah. So there's wonderful stories about um about about spirit children visiting as well. So I'm sorry, what was the what was this but that my camera going out threw me off? What was the question? I'm supposed to no, that was kind of the question. The oh, okay. the difference that a malevolent yeah. spirit always is, you know, some disembodied maybe a force or you can tell it's evil, but yeah. The other side of it, it's always someone that you recognize. Absolutely. I thought that was interesting. You instantly know it's yeah. somebody that you knew, you will know, that you feel at peace with. And that, you know, that's right along with Mormonism and sort of the black and white view, you know, that there's good, there's evil. You can tell the difference there. Yeah. So. Yeah. And there's, you know, that's, yeah, I've never encountered anybody who wasn't sure about the visitor. Uh, I mean, it's always clear. And the benevolent spirits, of course, if you don't recognize that person, they, they identify themselves. So the mm -hmm. ones who are often not recognized is the spirit of a future child who usually, I mean, they usually appear in not as sometimes as a child, not really, not really as a baby, but sometimes as an adult. And so they need to identify themselves that I'm, hi, Aaron, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Grace, I'm your third child, you need to get on it. And <laughs> have another baby because I'm waiting to come to earth. So yeah, so if in this rare case that you wouldn't recognize this benevolent spirit, they'll identify themselves. But yeah, and one of the things that I found, so, so, and so what I try to do throughout the book, and this is pretty typical of most anthropologists of religion, is we try to understand religious experience, religious practice from the point of view of the practitioners or the adherents or the people who are experiencing this. So I'm not you know, I'm not trying to explain these away as night terrors or, you know, some psychological problem. I mean, I don't, that's not interesting to me at all. What's interesting to me is how people who are being visited by spirits interpret that experience and understand that experience and frame it in the broader cultural environment. So, so one of the things that I, um, you know, I, I, I noted about the benevolent spirit visits is that for, for most people who have these, the, the, the significance is that they confirm the idea or the reality of the eternal family for the recipient of the visit. And so that's kind of the mo the take home message, right? So I might be getting advice on genealogy. I might be, maybe I'm being protected from a car accident by so-and-so or being, you know, encouraged to have children and get married or marry that guy, not that guy by a future child. But when people are talking broadly about what those experiences mean to them, they usually frame it as this, this was what showed me that the eternal family was real, that we're kind of all in this together. You know, we have the mortal, you know, people who are have, ex experiencing their mortal lives, but they're being, they're being assisted or they're being, and they're kind of, you know, in, in community with the broader family. So people who have, you know, those spirits who've not yet been born or those who've kind of passed out of the mortal existence. So that's one of the, in terms of how people frame the meaning of the, these experiences, that's, that's typically what is emphasized. Yeah, I think that's really important. And especially for Mormonism, because it is important to understand you lived before you yes. will live again. And when I think about now that you've brought that up, I can think of several experiences of relatives. Um, of course, there are a lot of deathbed experiences where the family members know that, you know, the husband came to reclaim grandma, you know, grandma seeing him coming to take her, you know, yeah. that you are going to this place where your family exists. I can think of a story from one of my grandmas where um, she woke up in the middle of the night and all of her sisters who had passed away were around her and they yeah. let her know, you can go now, you can come with us or you can continue in life for, you know, another decade or so, but you have the option. So I've heard stories like that where there's a you know, just a question, you have a choice to do this, you can do this or this, you know, they kind of put that, they po pose that to you. Did you come across other things like that? Yeah, absolutely. One of my favorite, one of my other favorite um, people that I, well, they were all favorites. So one of, one of my other favorite stories comes from a woman um, who I call Lynn in the book. And she has had some incredible experiences with um, the spirit of her mother who died when she was relatively young. And in one of those experiences, her mother communicates to her, you know, that she, they, their family had made an agreement in the pre-existence about someone would have to leave earth early and leave their children behind because their responsibilities in the spirit world. And so her mother came back to her and told her, so we are in the pre-existence, we all planned this, that I was going to be the one to leave early and her mother framed it to her it was it was 
I went so you didn't have to go. So she tells her that I we made this agreement because I had this responsibility in the spirit world and somebody in our family needed to fulfill this. And so we all decided that it was going to be me and I was going to leave Earth early. And this is a beautiful, beautiful story. And it's it's I mean, this woman, Lynn, has had the most incredible experiences. And she's very she's very she's you know, she's. She's what we sometimes call in anthropology a lay theologian. So someone who really thinks very deeply about theological matters and can frame her own experiences in this incredible way. So but so but that was and she's had a lot of other experiences as well. But that was one of the ones that I thought was so um, was so instructive because her mother, the spirit of her deceased mother is talking about how they had made this plan in the preexistence. So they did have a choice and they made that decision in the pre-existence. And then she came back to explain it to her daughter at a time when her daughter, you know, was going through, you know, some a harder time. Um, but yeah, but there's there are other stories like that as well about those choices that, okay, you can stay here and, you know, do this, or you can go there. And sometimes it is framed also that in that sense of obligation, like, okay, well, you, you know, you can stay here, but you're also needed there, right? There's someone, a relative of yours who's lonely, you know, who's you know, died years ago and is lonely and needs you to be there with them, but you can kind of make that choice. And so sometimes, you know, and and so these stories are framed, the choice is made, you know, it's not consistent that someone always chooses this or always chooses that. So, but I think that's, yeah, I think that's, that's a really, um, really interesting aspect of these, of these visitors. And, and one thing I think, I mean, and these, as you, you're you pointing out, these, these are common, not just in, you know, in Mormon communities in Utah, they're common everywhere in the world. And I think that, you know, one of the, if you think about kind of the, what I think of as the broader significance of this project is that there's, you know, there's a really rich anthropological literature on experiences of the spirit world, things like spirit possession in so many parts of the world, particularly in Africa and parts of Latin America and parts of Asia. And we don't have a lot of ethnographic research on how people in kind of the wealthy industrialized global North are interacting with spirits, but they absolutely are. So it's not that, okay, this is just something people do in, in Brazil or in, you know, in East Africa or in, you know, Southeast Asia, these experiences are kind of part of the, just part of being human. Um, but what I think is, you know, and so we hear about these in lots of other places, but what I'm really looking at in this book is how, how these are particularly Latter-day Saint or Mormon experiences. And so how they're framed in the broader cultural context of, I mean, I was just really looking at experience. I mean, I have a couple, I talk about a couple, you know, I, 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 outside of Utah a little bit, but I was mo mostly focusing on, on Cache Valley and experiences of people who are from Cache Valley or, or, or elsewhere in northern Utah. Um, but but I had, you know, over the course of doing this project, I did have people reach out and say, I remember my mom, one of my mom's friends in, in Logan and in Cache Valley was super interested and she'd had a lot of spirit experiences as well, but she wasn't Mormon. She wasn't raised in the church. And so, and so I told, you know, I said, well, you know, I'd love to talk to her, but I, I but for this project, I, if she thinks that her understanding of these experiences have been informed by the fact that she lives in this overwhelmingly Mormon culture, then I definitely want to interview her. However, the person, you know, she said, oh no, not at all. This has nothing to do with me being living in, in Mormon land. It's <laughs> just completely separate from that. And so I said, well, that then for not, then I wouldn't, that's not, that's not what I want to do for this project make a great other project. But I really was interested in experiences that are, that are interpreted within the context of, you know, kind of Utah Mormon culture. Um, and, and there, you know, it doesn't matter if people are still in the church, out of the church, not going to church, you know, or have formally left it. But so I, I, you know, I kind of ran the, the, the book kind of, you know, there's, there's a, there's a broad a, a broad cross section of folks who are, you know, still very much, you know, very, you know, going to church every Sunday, very devout, very much, um, very much, very active in the church. And there are others who have, you know, kind of, kind of less active. There are others, a couple of people I talked to who formerly left the church, um, but still can talk about these experiences and want to talk about these experiences as being, you know, very much informed by their upbringing in, in, in the church or in Utah. That's that's what I wanted to ask you about. Uh, do do you find that uh, most of the experience seem to be framed based on their religion, um, and they they interpret it? You know, there was a pre-existence. I'm Mormon. I believe in a pre-existence. I believe in an afterlife. Uh, do do you see? You know, 
babies coming to say, mom, you need to have another child in Mormonism. Do you see that same thing in Islam where, you know, spirits, you, you don't see spirits or they don't talk with the dead, supposedly that's a kind of taboo. Yeah. Uh, do, do people frame it in, in, in their religious upbringing? And how do you account for that as an anthropologist? How do you say, well, you know, if, if, why wouldn't, why wouldn't, uh, some a baby come to an Islam uh, Islamic mother and say, "Hey, it's time to have me," as opposed to a, an LDS mother. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Yeah, so so again, I think spirit experiences are more com more common, you know, in cultures worldwide than 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 not. Um, but they are framed in different ways, and they are framed with reference to particular religious traditions and particular cultural environments. So, yeah, so I I think the experiences of spirit children is, is coming to a future family, a mother or father, a sibling, um, maybe even a grandmother. I've heard a couple of stories about that, you know, where grandma's supposed to encourage her daughter or son to have more children. So because this grandchild came, that is very, I mean, that's something that I have not encountered in other religious traditions or in other cultural contexts. And I think that, I mean, I think part of it comes out of Latter-day Saint ideas about the existence of spirit children, right? So that is something very particular um, in Latter-day Saint cosmology or theology that everybody exists as a spirit and then has to be born into this mortal life in order to, you know, kind of advance on the path towards salvation or exaltation eventually. And so that is, you know, that's, there may be certain parallels in other religious traditions, that's, but that's very specifically Latter-day Saints. So there's, um, I mean, I think there's, and I, I have a brief footnote in the book about a different kind of spirit child in, in that, uh, that people have discussed in, in certain parts of West Africa, but it's not the same at all. It's, um, it's, it's, it's really quite, different, I think. Uh, in terms of, yeah, in terms of other spirits, yeah, again, it's very common in Islam. There's a whole category of being that are known as jinn. Um, you might be familiar with that term. It's where we get the English term genie. So, but it's actually, you know, it's part of God's creation. So in Islamic, oh, sorry, I have a, a kid raiding the, fr the fridge. So sorry for the, <laughs> the background noise. Um, but yeah, so in Islam, there's, you know, as part of God's creation, you have angels, humans and then jinn which are which are spirits and are very similar to um very similar angels are kind of in their own category but humans and jinn are kind of similar in that they they can be good they can be bad angels are pretty much always good in in the islamic tradition um so yeah so people can interact with spirits with jinn it's very common um but it's but not maybe necessarily in exactly the same way. So, um, so one thing I think that in the anthropological literature on on experiences with the spirit world, a lot of the literature focuses on possession. So people who are being possessed, and and it's not necessarily possession isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily an evil thing. And probably most of the anthropological literature on spirit possession, a lot of it comes from. Um, the Caribbean, a lot of it comes from Afro-Brazilian tradition, a lot of it comes from certain parts of Africa, certain parts of East, uh, Southeast and South Asia. And, and most of the time possession is, is, it's kind of, it's either neutral or sometimes even a positive thing. So it's not necessarily a bad spirit that's coming to take over your body, like in the movie, The Exorcist, which is kind of the classic American reference point for possession. Um, it's something that can be accommodated. So, you know, if you have the capacity to be possessed by a spirit, that means you have a certain spiritual ability or a certain affinity with that particular spirit who's possessing you. And so one of the things when I, you know, when I'm teaching about this subject, one of the things that I like to emphasize to my classes is that even though so many, so many anthropologists have written about, say, spirit possession, that's only one one way of interacting with the spirit world. There's a lot more than that. And again, in the, in the, in the, the context of, you know, Latter-day Saints, possession experiences are very, very rare. That's, I mean, I never came across really any, anybody who'd been possessed or knew anyone. Well, the only times I, I talked to people about possession was from former missionaries reporting on things they'd seen while in the mission field and being asked to maybe intervene in a case of possession. So I have a couple of really interesting, um, narratives about that uh, in, I think it's uh, one of the chapters of the book, chapter six, maybe chapter five. So, but that's, it's, I, you know, I don't really have any stories of possession being 
reported in Utah. Um, one, there's one narrative from the folklore collection that, you know, talks about a guy who gets possessed by the devil at a party, but that's, you know, it's just, it's a, it's an interesting narrative and I include it in there, but that's just not the way that people usually talk about these spirit experiences. Even when a, when a spirit, an evil spirit comes, it's usually not to possess, it's to harass, you know, you're, you're, it's, it's to, to maybe, maybe threaten, usually kind of just to irritate and, 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 and to harass somebody. So possession is, is pretty unusual, though. I'd love to hear if you have, if anybody has more stories about that actual experiences of possession, that's something I'd be very interested in hearing more about just because it's, um, it's not something that I encountered much at all, aside from experiences where a few missionaries, you know, reported usually being asked to try to help when somebody is right. possessed or being interpreted as being possessed by their family. And so, you know, missionaries are, can you help us with this, you know, young woman who's been possessed? Is there anything you can do? So um, did I answer your question, Landon? Uh, yeah. Rebecca actually has several uh, s scenarios with, with her son on a mission in, in uh, the Navajo yeah. nation. Oh, uh, and, really? and I, th I think I, I agree a hundred percent with what you say in Mormon, in Mormonism, possession is almost always a non-member who is possessed. That's exactly. Hardly ever do you hear about a member being possessed. Exactly. So. Yeah, exactly. That was well said, Landon. Yeah, the only the only narrative I heard, I mean, I, I didn't even hear it. It was something I came across in the folklore collection. And it was, um, I want to say that it was something, it was a student who reported something that happened in Tremont. And, you know, I, or Briggins, I can't remember. And I, I don't remember exactly, but I do, I do include that narrative in the book. But it was someone who was kind of misbehaving at a party and you know, drinking and smoking and whatever, and then suddenly turning very red. And so the, the other kids at the party interpreted that as being possessed by the devil. And so they went next door and the bishop lived next door or something and came and managed to cast out that, that spirit from that person. But that was really the only one who of that's the only time I encountered even a report or a story about someone who's a member of the church being possessed. Yeah, I think sometimes, uh, where did we hear this land? And it was one of our guests a couple of days ago, I think, where their their father was asked to go and cast out a spirit of a woman, but it was it was just a, a mental episode, you know, ah, it was okay. just a manic episode. It was not, but from a Mormon perspective, they're, oh, and this was years and years ago, I think before okay. we knew more you know, about those kinds of episodes that j just assuming, you know, it's not mental health, it must be demons, right? The right, answer is yeah. it must always be demons. So, right. Well, and I do have in one of the book, one of the chapters, of the book does focus, focus specifically on casting out and powers of the priesthood and kind of contesting powers of the priesthood in this, this spiritual arena. And all of the, I, you know, all of the, aside from that one story that I mentioned about the well, maybe it wasn't Tremont. I can't remember now. But yeah, all of the casting outs are usually, you know, casting an evil spirit out of someone who's harassing a home or kind of lurking in the corner of the bedroom. So though that's what happens with the casting out. Usually it's not it's not casting them out of a person who's been possessed. Right. Like a dark aura yeah. or a dark yeah. presence, you know, because, you know, yeah. Mormons dedicate their homes and there's a special prayer that you say to keep those things away, you know, and yeah. then if you do sense that you would have your priesthood leader come in. I think we heard a story on another podcast about some girls at a girl's camp where there was an evil presence in a tent, you know, and they had to have a priesthood leader come in and say a special prayer and make sure yeah. that that presence would leave. So there's a oh. lot of stories like that. And to me, those sort of say they're to confirm the power of the, L the LDS priesthood, you know, yeah. that this priesthood is strong enough that it can protect you even from otherworldly influences. So in that way, I think it's comforting to people. But I was just remembering another experience that um, this would be a somebody on my husband's side of the family where they woke up at night and the devil, <laughs> although it's interesting, LDS people either say Satan, they don't say Lucifer so much. They mm. sometimes say the devil. It kind of depends on what era. When you say, Landon, what era yeah. you were raised in in the church, either Lucifer, Satan, devil, yes. the adversary is also another way to kind of even farther remove it. But this relative had seen the devil on the staircase and uh -huh. she walked out and like you said, just harassing. I mean, yeah. didn't really even seem to be there for a purpose or to ask anything, but was yeah. just there. And yeah, the person was able to understand this is an evil presence. I, I'm going 
trying to, you know, turn away. It's almost like this, I don't know, <laughs> rite of passage where you've been able to overcome something evil that yeah. reaffirms your righteousness, perhaps. So absolutely. I think that's that's so yeah, that's yeah, absolutely. One of the, you know, kind of I I when I talk about the evil spirits visiting. I, there's, there's, there's a couple different ways, you know, a couple different categories of people they'll visit. And so certainly people who are falling off the path of righteousness, right? So they're certainly could attract um, an evil spirit who's, who's interested in their licentious activity. But also one of the things I think is so interesting is that it's the exceptionally right, righteous who also attract the interests of Satan or, you know, you're right. I don't hear Lucifer that often, but Satan or the devil, Lucifer seems to be kind of something used in, back in the day, yeah. that term or that name, um, but yeah, so I do write about the exceptionally righteous or the the the, the evil spirits' attempts to thwart the righteous, and so these are they're one as you I'm sure you know the wonderful stories from people on missions who've had I mean missionaries seem to be especially targeted you know when people are doing this what is supposed supposed to be this exceptionally righteous work, that's when they might be particularly subject to harassment, and there's some there's some great. Um, there's some really great narratives from the MTC come that kind of focus on MTC and Provo and experiences that uh, people are having there. So I, I write about those as well. And there was something, your comment also reminded me of something else I wanted to share, but um, it slipped my mind. Sorry. <laughs> It'll come to you. Well, Landon has served a mission. Haven't you Landon? What do you think about um, that and the, and the experiences? And I think you yourself have had a few unexplainable experiences. Uh, situations arise on your mission yeah the the mission was where where i had any experience with that and you know i'm I, i'm not a believer in that and i look for uh at at this point and you know most things you can explain away this is one thing i have not been able to explain away um and that was when i was on my mission uh I was I was sick and so I was in in the bedroom and i was uh in i'd been in bed because i couldn't um i, I couldn't uh tracked or anything. So I was in my bed, the companion was in the other room. Uh, and I got up, I was coughing, I got up to do something. And all of a sudden, I felt this really dark presence. And I was I was like, what what's going on? And then as I started walking, uh, I had a fan on the dresser and that fan, all of a sudden, came right at me and it was plugged in. And when it hit at the end of the plug, it dropped to the ground. And so it didn't hit me. But it it fell on the ground and and I I was like I'd felt that dark presence wondering what was going on and then all of a sudden that fan came flying across the room and, and almost hit me but uh, uh, I have no you know I didn't see anything yeah. no voice came nothing I just right. felt that dark presence and then that fan and so that's one thing that uh, you know I've always said what uh, I I can't explain that that's one of the things I can't put anything to. But it, it it definitely was an experience that I, I I won't forget. Did you tell your companion about it, or did you just sort of say that was weird? And I, I can't on? remember because I'm I'm sure it made a quite a noise when the fan hit the ground right. and stuff, and he he probably came in. But I I just remember that dark feeling, and then that fan. Uh, uh, I'm going okay. I, the dark feeling I could explain away how the fan came across the room and, you know, hit the An ground. An evil entity threw a that. fan at you. That's what happened, Landon. <laughs> yes, yes. And and it can't be because we were having so much success because we had no success. <laughs> you had no success in Indiana. No, so there was that. nothing to stop. You know? Then maybe it was a good spirit trying to throw a fan at you to just yeah, get, your, get your rear in gear, right? And <laughs> That's a fa that's a really fascinating story. Um, that's, yeah, and it does seem... You know, it does. It doesn't. It doesn't seem super unusual in terms of missionary experiences. Um, that's. I'm so sorry. I don't know why my camera keeps. I'm not doing that intentionally. My camera. No, keeps, it's a ghost know. in the machine. I'm it, telling you, this is an episode about the other world, and we have some people know? trying to zoom in. That's what's happening. So. Yes. It's also, <laughs> extremely windy here, so I don't know. I don't know. I mean, my the Wi-Fi seems pretty stable. I don't know what's going on with that. So I, I will apologize. It's not me you know, tuning out your, 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 your <laughs> no, right. not at all. So why, why do you yeah. think that missionaries tend to have these experience? I mean, to me, it seems like they're in this unfamiliar, supercharged, maybe sometimes uncomfortable out of their comfort zone, you know, mental health wise environment, maybe, you know, they, they're sort of more susceptible to these kinds of experiences, whether they're, you know, more self-induced or not. I mean, I don't know, but you're right. Missions are where you hear these stories all the time. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a great question. It's something I explore a little bit um, in the book as well. And I think that, I mean, so missionaries, yes, definitely, you know, both men and women on missions. I mean, I have more, just because more missionaries are male, I have more stories from men, but I also include um, an interview with a a, a young woman who'd recently turned from her mission had a really fascinating experience as well. Um, and so, yeah, and also I think that, so it's, I think, yes, there's something about that context of being on the mission and in terms of the cultural framing of it, it's when you're, you know, trying to be, I mean, we know not every missionary is trying to be super righteous, right? But again, in terms of the cultural framework, this is a very important part of your life, right? In terms of your, in, in terms of your, religious service. So it's this, it's it, so in that cultural framework, this is, you're trying to do something really important. Landon sounds like you were not very, <laughs> you were not meeting those markers of success as they were defined. So yeah, it wasn't, it didn't seem like an attempt to thwart the especially successful missionary here, but I think we can kind of understand it in the broader framework of it's young people in general who tend to have more of these experiences with evil spirits. When I started researching, you know, one of my, when I started this project at one point, you know, as an academic, you always have to apply for funds to, to, you know, to do the project. And one of the grant proposals that I wrote at the very beginning of this project, I I kind of, I generated this hypothesis after some initial work in the folklore collection that, you know, based on my initial reading, it seemed to me like, oh, well, it seems to be young women who are most likely to be, this was wrong, but I, I thought at the time it was mo young women who are most likely to be harassed by evil spirits. And then they were kind of saved by, you know, a, a priesthood holder who was, of course, male. And so I wrote one short grant proposal using this as a hypothesis saying, you know, it, based on my preliminary experience in the folklore archives, it seems like lots of these experiences are young women. But then when I did the actually, you know, went and did the did more research and did the kind of the ethnographic component of the project where I'm working with people, not just reading narratives that have been collected, that wasn't the case at all. Sure, young women are harassed by evil spirits, but young men are just as likely to be harassed by spirits. And so what I found out, it was more young people. It was young people in general. And one of the, you know, I talked to, I had this, a series of interviews with a, a seminary teacher um, at a high school in Cache Valley. It's just absolutely wonderful. And so I include a lot of that in the, in the book. And we talked about this at one point about this observation that I had that it seemed to be, it, most of the experiences with evil spirits or malevolent spirits were with younger people, not with older people. Um, and, and when I talked to the seminary teacher about it, one of the ways he framed this was, well, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, young people are this, this phase of questioning, right? So they're, they're this phase of questioning. They're trying to figure out their place in the world. Like, where do I belong? Do I belong in church? Do I not belong in church? And so they, so in his framing, he thought that it made sense because it was this, this time of transition and a time where people might be very open to other kinds of influences. And I think um, one thing that I found in an article, I have a couple you know, at scholarly articles that I've published on this material as well that are already out, so I can send those along if you like. But one of them I published in an anthropology journal on the benevolent spirits, and the other one I published in a religious studies journal on evil spirits. And in the academic publishing, you know, you, you send your article out for review and then you send it to the journal, they send it out for review to anonymous experts in the field, and then they get back, you know, with revisions. And, and so one of the things that I was asked to include in this article for the Religious Studies Journal was a little bit more comparison to other kinds of non-Mormon experiences, particularly in the U.S. or North, broader North America of evil spirit experiences. And so... And so I'd love that suggestion because I didn't know a ton about that. So I had to go do some additional reading. And there's really, really wonderful work in, in religious studies on, on um, similar experiences, but in other Christian communities in, in the U.S. And but there are also there's some notable differences. And so one of the things that I noted was that in other types of Christian communities, in, you know, say evangelical Christians or charismatic Catholics who tend to have a lot of, you know, or talk a lot about these experiences of, or, or kind of the, the possibility of, of evil spirits is that they're often outside the Mormon tradition, they're often kind of equated with vices, right? So, so a, the spirit of greed or the spirit of lust, or that's, you know, and they kind of talk about, it's a different way of framing it that, okay, so I was, you know, in, in the sense that, some kind of 
non-ideal behavior might be attributed to a negative spiritual influence, right? So, and they might be identified as, okay, this, this spirit, this greed spirit or this lust spirit has kind of gotten hold of me and is causing me or encouraging me to do bad things. And I think in that what, one of the things, it's really quite different from the Mormon tradition where the spirits, the evil spirits aren't named and they're not attributed to vices. Or if they are, I haven't seen that yet. So if people are doing that. It's not something I've encountered yet. And it's more that the, you know, the, the, the maybe non-ideal behavior, the partying behavior or the, you know, illicit sexual activity isn't blamed on the influence of a spirit. It's, it's framed as attracting a spirit, right? So if you're kind of being naughty, then a spirit might be attracted to that behavior because evil spirits rejected the opportunity to have a mortal body, right? And so the evil spirits are followers of Lucifer or Satan, and they've never gotten the opportunity to have the mortal body and thus proceed as, you know, as a, a, a normal spirit. I don't know, <laughs> a, a, you know, a, a kind of along the path that a, that a human would. And so sometimes they're attracted to those very human experiences, right? So they're not able to have those bodily experiences. And so I noticed that as being a particularly a particular difference between, say, how people that I worked with are framing these evil spirit experiences um, in a way that's really quite different from other American Christians and other Christian traditions. Um, but yeah, but and but it's, it's a long way of circling back to your question. But yeah, it does seem that you know for the malevolent spirits, they do seem to be more attracted to to younger people who are maybe you know kind of questioning boundaries are. Um, you know, kind of on that 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 slippery slope, right? And kind of testing boundaries and thinking about what their place is, what their what their spiritual path or lack thereof is going to be. So I think, and so I think we could in, certainly include missionaries in that broader group of young people. Because I don't, I also don't have, and I would love to hear, if, if you know, I'd love to hear stories of of you know older missionaries, right? So all the missionaries that I worked with went, went on a mission at the at the at, during during their youth. So as, as, as most people do. So I haven't had, I haven't talked to anyone who's had interesting experiences, you know, doing kind of serving a mission in their, in their middle years or, or later as some people do, but that's a great, that's a great question, Landon. Did you come across any stories of protection, like the three Nephites? Did anyone uh, talk about that? Yeah, because that's also, I think, also very mission centric. You hear all these stories, you know, missionaries are there and a scary guy comes up to them and then turns around and behind them, the missionaries can't see, but there are warriors <laughs> protecting them. All yeah. kinds of stories like that are told over and over in, in Mormonism. Yeah, that's, I yes. And those, there's some really wonderful folklore work on the three Nephites and others. But yeah, so I encountered those only in reference to people saying stories that I've heard, right? Or in, but not in terms, I did not encounter anyone who'd had a recent experience with the three Nephites, so, or warriors protecting them. So that's, yeah, so I'm familiar with those stories because they're such a rich, rich part of, um, you know, Mormon, Mormon folklore and 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 the narrative tradition of, of Utah and broader kind of Mormondom. Um, but in terms of working with people who'd had those experiences, not at all. So, or, you know, or experiences of sightings of Cain. I mean, none, none of those. So I didn't find, <laughs> heard, you all know those stories, but yes, oh, yeah. I didn't, I didn't talk to anybody who'd had those kinds of experiences. I've had, you know, in terms of um, notable religious figures, shall we say, I did talk to one I, I do include one person who had um, an experience with Joseph, the spirit of Joseph Smith, um, and one who had, as a very young child, an experience with Jesus. So those, but as, but those, so I have a section in one of the chapters, I don't, notable religious, I mean, to say the... <laughs> mildly, right? But most of, yes, I can't remember what I call that section of the chapter, but those were super unusual. And in all the conversations I've had and all the narratives I've read, they, that, that was, those are the only two that I really, and those were, you know, people I talked to about those experiences. Um, so those were kind of, you know, extra special, I mean, they're all special experiences, but those were kind of extra special experiences. Um, but yes, no, I never talked to anyone who'd seen the three Nephites, um, but my I would, son did. <laughs> your <laughs> son did? Really? <laughs> He was broken down on Lake Powell and uh, they, they'd gone out skiing. They were way out in, the, mm -hmm. in some arm of the lake and, and had broken down and uh, they were trying to figure out how they were going to get back. And all of a sudden a boat with three men came 
and had the part that they needed to get the boat started and get out of there. So he says it's the three Nephites, but then he said, ah, they were wearing pink Speedos, though. <laughs> so. Oh, that's that's hilarious. <laughs> so, that's oh, okay. I think that might have to be our thumbnail graphic, the three Nephites and pink Speedos. I think that would drive So, yeah, down. we call it the three Nephites and, and pink Speedos. <laughs> oh, that's, that's wonderful. They didn't identify themselves, I guess. Huh? No, they didn't identify as that. <laughs> Oh, that's a great, that is a really great story. But yeah, no, I would, I would love to talk to people who've had experiences with it. But I, you know, I was, I was, I was looking for that because I'm familiar with all of those from folklore. You know, there's just so many great, there's so many great folklorists who've worked on those, those, um, those stories. But yeah, in terms of, in terms of people I work with, nobody had nobody'd seen the three knee fights unfortunately. but everybody knew yes. of those stories to me yeah. that's what's important i mean i feel like especially in mormonism these stories are encouraged yes. they're expected they're welcomed they're yes. accepted you know when you think about any given sacrament meeting anyone can get up and say you know my my grandfather appeared to me the other day and everyone's yes. nodding and accepting if you were to say that say at school or something people would think it was very strange but in mormonism in that microcosm there it's very accepted and you're almost seen as you know closer to the spirit world you hear that phrase meaning that you you receive these experiences you're a special kind of a person who get who can have these experiences yeah. so you almost feel bad if you didn't have one i never had one like that i was afraid of anything like that and um, when anybody would talk about it i would just kind of uh, probably because of how i was raised but you know mm -hmm. very welcome i mean does that play a part in people being comfortable in even interpreting yes. it for themselves because look at Landon he had his fan you know fly at him but you still are kind of like yeah there must be something because right. he's always kind of been more of a I don't know agnostic type thinker yeah. but in true Mormonism it seems like you interpret that through your religion and you would say this absolutely is this yes. so I wonder if you could talk yeah, about that absolutely a I'm yeah you said that so well so yeah one of the ideas I I, I use this idea of cultural kindling that I actually um, that 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 a, a couple of other anthropologists, Julia Cassanidi and Tanya Lerman, who are two two other anthropologists who are interested in such things in different, not in Mormonism, but in different religious communities around the world, and they use this idea of cultural kindling to kind of compare what they call uncanny experiences. Um, what I you know for this for me and my research, it's experience of the spirit world, and they they do this comparative work across cultures, and so they use this idea of kindling to talk about the cultural environment that allows people to interpret these uncanny experiences in particular ways. And so, so yeah, a lot of people ask, well, why did you, you know, why did you focus on Cache Valley for say, I mean, and I, I look a little bit outside of Cache Valley. I, I mean, I focused on Cache Valley because I, I grew up in Cache Valley and I know, you know, I know the community. I, you know, it's, I'm not Mormon, but it's my culture anyway. You know, I grew up there. That is my cultural environment even though I grew up in a different church. And I knew that this was something that was common there. And I also know that there's a lot of kindling, right? So there's people, as you said, Rebecca, people hear these stories all the time, right? You hear them, you hear them at sacrament meeting, you hear them at, you know, at youth activities. You, I mean, I didn't grow up Mormon, but I heard these stories frequently. I mean, to me, that was the kind of thing those Mormons have the, you know, the devil doesn't visit Episcopalian, the non-Mormons, you know, that's the devil visits Mormons, not, you know, there's things, I mean, and that's how I grew up. I thought in my mind, there were certain things that were for Mormons and certain things that were for non-Mormons. And to me, that was, I mean, I never really thought about the, I mean, our church didn't talk about the devil. It was not part of, <laughs> it was not part of Sunday for us. Um, so it didn't ever occur to me that the devil might visit me. So, or other spirits. So it's yeah, that's that was for Mormons. Um, but so that's so it's this very rich environment where there is a lot of kindling, so to speak, where you know that that when something uncanny happens, that you're in a framework where you interpret that as a particular type of experience. And so when you know, people sometimes ask, well, have you had any of these experiences yourself? And so my response is that I don't think so. If I did, I didn't recognize it as such. And so, you know, so even though I grew up in that environment, it was not part of my household environment. And so it was part of the, the atmosphere, so to speak, but it wasn't something that was emphasized in my family of origin at all. And so I don't think I, and so again, with the way that I kind of framed everything as a non, you know, there's the Mormons and the non-Mormons, right? And that's, we were in this little group of, I mean, I love, I mean, a very happy child, it was a perfect childhood, tons of friends, but it was, I still kind of define things as 
that is for them, this is for us. And so that would never have occurred to me that those kinds of things would happen to me or my family. Um, and so, so I'm not kindled in exactly the same way, right? I mean, I think I'm open to, because I grew up in that environment, I'm very open to hearing people's experiences and wanting to understand them on their terms, but it's not something that I was particularly attuned to for me. But I also know that this is something, you know, this is something that can, can be cultivated. One of the, I mentioned Lynn earlier um, as someone that I, you know, interview a few times for the project. And we, we talked about this at one point. Um, and I think it was after my father had passed away and, and we just, we were, we were chatting about something. And I said, you know, I've never really had any of these experiences of, of an ancestor, a deceased kin uh, member of my family visit. And what Lynn said to me is that I can teach you how to recognize that. And so from her framework, it's, it's kind of like a skill. She's, you know, that she's, it doesn't, she's like, Aaron, it's possible that you've had a visitor, but you just don't know how to recognize a visitor. So, and so we haven't done that yet, you know, but it was really, I mean, I just love that she'd said that, that she was framing it. It's like, well, you can learn how to recognize spirits when they come. And so, um, yeah, but so so but yes, but I think in terms of kind of being open to that, it's it's very much part of the end. It doesn't mean that there isn't skepticism, right? Of course there's skepticism. Right. Not everybody, you know, depending on who stands up in sacrament meeting and says, My grandpa came to me last night. Yeah. Sometimes people are gonna be like, Oh, that's amazing. And other, you know, if another person could say that and everybody's gonna roll their eyes and like, yeah, I mean, that's you know, and that's what I I'm kind of I'm remembering one of the folks I interviewed saying that, you know, it really kind of depends, right? And so sometimes someone could stand up in church and be like, oh, here we go again, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and then somebody else will say it. And they, you know, it's, it's, there's this great, there's this really famous anthropologist, old British anthropologist from back in the day called Evan, uh, Edward Evan, Evans Pritchard. It's a very long name, Evan <laughs> Pritchard for short, but he did, he's one of the most famous anthropologists who studied. Um, ideas about magic and witchcraft. And his one of his most famous works is looking at ideas of magic and witchcraft among a people called the Azande in, in kind of East Central Africa. And he has a really famous book on this. And he talks about witchcraft or the idea that people can cause harm to other people through unseen forces. And usually it's unintentional. You can be, you know, you're a witch without knowing it really. And he says that, you know, witchcraft is so pervasive in this community that it's just the framework that everybody understands human life in. But it also doesn't mean that every kind of misfortune that happens is going to be attributed to witchcraft. A lot of misfortune is, but there's also skepticism. And he has this wonderful example of, say, you know, of someone who's a potter, a ceramic, you know, so making pots. And so this, a potter is making pots and then a bunch of, a whole batch, I don't know if that's the right word, I don't do ceramics, but a whole batch of pots breaks. And so the potter might say, oh, it's witchcraft, I was bewitched and someone, you know, bewitched me. So all of my hard work would be destroyed. But then someone else might say, no, you're just a bad potter. <laughs> you're just not very skilled. <laughs> and so I love that example because it shows that it's not, you know, cultures are complex and people are complex. And you can hold these understandings of these, you know, of say that the that you can hold this belief in, you know, quote unquote witchcraft or or spirit experience, but it doesn't mean that every single account is going to be treated in exactly the same way, right? So so I always love that example of his kind of the skepticism about witchcraft. It's like, yeah, we know witchcraft exists, but you can't blame every little thing that happens. Maybe you're just a bad cook and that's why the meal didn't turn out. <laughs> Maybe you're just a bad potter and that's why all your pots broke. And so I think it's, you know, it's kind of the same thing. That environment there is so rich in in the, you know, in the context of Mormon spirit experiences that Absolutely. Like, and just you, you know, I mean, everybody I talked to, not everybody wanted to talk to me about this because they are private and they are special. And I really respect that. And so I'm so grateful for the people who are willing to share their experiences with me. And I know a lot of the people I talked to had not talked about these experiences a lot, but, and I, I, I mean, I am eternally grateful that they're willing to share them with me, knowing that I was going to be publishing them. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I just, I just am so, so grateful. I can't thank people enough for sharing this, but other people didn't want to share that. And I completely respect that because they are so, they are, you know, often understood as sacred private experiences that um, maybe shouldn't. And for some people, you know, certain kinds of experiences shouldn't be shared with others, but, but you're right in terms of, in terms of the broader environment that the, it's, it's, 
it's, you know, the soil is rich, right? That you can, yes. you can have these experiences, you can understand them, and you can talk to a community who understands that the possibility of those experiences is there. So I had, um, Landon, your story about your mission reminded me of one, one um, man I worked with. I think I call him Greg in the book, but he's, um, he had a very, he had his experience just after he'd returned from his mission and he'd, um, he was in graduate school in the Midwest somewhere. And he was, you know, he was mid twenties, probably recently returned from his mission um, and living in, you know, he was living with a family in his ward in this town in the Midwest. And he'd had a very terrifying experience of kind of being, I think of being pinned down by this threatening force. And he experienced that as, um, you know, as an evil spirit visiting and threatening him. And he was so shook by this experience. He didn't really know what to do. And so he talked, see, the man, the man who was the, kind of the, the father of the house he was living in was a member of his ward. And he was, you know, kind of a, he was an older priesthood holder. And so he thought, well, this is the person I need to talk to. And so he says he went to talk to this man and the man kind of, you know, he said it was really unsatisfying because this older man just kind of looked at him like he was crazy, right? And he said he wasn't interested in learning about this threatening experience. I thought he was just worried that I was going to be disruptive member of his household and that I had, you know, I was unstable. Yeah. And so one of the things we talked about, he said, you know, I kind of feel like if I told somebody this in back home, back in Utah, and actually this fellow wasn't, he didn't grow up in Utah, but he moved to BYU for college. And so he spent a lot of time in Utah. But I think, as I recall, I think him, he was saying that, you know, it was a weird experience for me because I felt like if I told a senior priesthood holder at home or back in Utah, everybody would have understood yeah. and we would have tried to figure out what was going on or how to prevent it. But in this case, even though I was living with members of the church, there was uh, there was a lot of skepticism and, you know, the, the, I wasn't taken seriously at all. But I think that might have just been a one off, too, because I've talked to, you know, since this, this book is I'm thrilled that it's generating interest. I just wish that work on Islamic courts in East Africa was an interest. <laughs> <laughs> well, well um, they'll find this book and then they'll read your other books. So yeah, everybody read part. all of Aaron's books. OK, yeah, we'll put that other. <laughs> it might not be as exciting. I think it's exciting. But it's a little bit further. I mean, it's a little bit further removed, farther from home. But but, you know, since I've been working working on this project, I've had a lot of people tell me, well, okay, so yeah, you're, you're writing about this particular community in Northern Utah, but this is, this is, of course, these experiences are mm -hmm. happening elsewhere. So, I mean, I think that, and so I could, I certainly could have done this project somewhere else. I think that what is so useful about having done it in Cache Valley, where I grew up, is that it's such, I mean, it's, well, first of all, it's overwhelmingly Latter-day Saint, right? Mm -hmm. The vast majority of people are members of the church. And it's just, in, the, in that sense, it makes it easy. It's easy to talk to people about this. It's easy for people. Everybody nods and says, oh, yeah, of course, I know all about these experiences. Go talk mm -hmm. to my aunt. She's an expert on the spirit world. She'll have a ton to tell. You know, it's just there isn't there isn't kind of a hurdle to get over where people are kind of looking like, oh, well, yeah, I've kind of heard about that. But, I'm, you know, should we really talk about this? So it's it's kind of it's it's I, I mean, easy is the wrong word, but it's a, it's an easy place to do research of this kind because it's so pervasive. Yeah. And I think everybody shares the same point of view, you know, in this little microcosm, like there's, it's always hard to get to the temple, right? Something is stopping you from going yeah. to the temple. That is a big one. Yeah. Elsewhere, other than Utah, a person would say, well, you just lost your keys and then you forgot to fill your ca car up with gas. So what? In Utah, they're going to say, oh, the adversary your keys, exactly. and then there was no gas. You were trying to go to the temple. They were stopping you. So there's just exactly. this underlying understanding yes. and construct for these experiences yes. that you have in these communities. Exactly. Yeah. And that doesn't really need to be explained, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah. It's, it's just, just a given. Yeah. Yeah. It's what this famous anthropologist Clifford Gertz calls that local knowledge, right? It's just the local knowledge is 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 there. And so you have this framework that you don't need to explain that extra step, right? So- yeah, absolutely. I think that's true. Mm -hmm. Did you have any more questions, Landon? Sorry, I was cutting you no, off. I'm no, like, I'm I just, it, this, it's, I'm it's interesting this. because that that's one of the things that that uh, I guess as an anthropologist, you probably you know your job's not to interpret or determine how is this happening or is this a real spirit or not. Right. You're you're just documenting this is how the local people yeah. do it, and, and and that's always been kind of my question is you know if as you look at different cultures you you would think that if if it were real you'd be seeing the same thing across all 
all people would be seeing the same thing. So they've got to be putting it in terms of the way they understand the world. Um, and so I, as, as an anthropologist, when you're asking these questions, do, do you ever look at it and say, oh, these people are off their rockers or, uh, you know, or, or, you, or, or do you remove yourself somehow? Because it's really interesting because you're, you're looking at what, you know, at, at the culture of, of us as LDS people or former LDS people that we grew up in, you know, now that we step back from it, we look at it and we go, oh my gosh, was I doing that? You know, or was that how I was? And you kind of question yourself, and and I don't know what how you do that as as you know you're someone who's never been in, but you've seen it from the outside. So we kind of get an outside look at ourselves from you, which is yeah. a, a kind of a neat perspective. So how do you how do you deal with that when you're dealing with people? Well, you just explained it really well. Um, so what we do is we kind of it, there's this 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 term we use in anthropology called cultural relativism, where we and we teach this everybody in Anth 101. That's one of the first things they learn is cultural relativism, where with cultural relativism, you avoid judging one culture's practices by the standards of another. So you really try to see things from the point of view of the practitioners. And then in the anthropology of religion, we kind of you know take it a step farther where we are not theologians. We are not seeking truth. We're not missionaries. So we're there to understand and to observe and to talk to people and not to evaluate. And so, so when I teach, I teach, you know, I teach a lot of different classes. And one of my favorite classes is an upper division uh, course on the anthropology of religion um, at University of Nevada called Magic, Witchcraft, and Religion. It's quite popular, as you might imagine. It's a, yeah, it's a, oh my I, I didn't name the class, but it's, um, but yeah, one of the things that we start off with is we talk about, you know, as an anthropologist studying religion, we're not we're not looking for truth. We're not looking for the true religion or the true God or gods. And we're not trying to evaluate, are these spirits real? Are these gods real? Are these people, you know, or do they have a nutritional deficiency that is causing them to think they're put? I mean, that's not, exactly. there have been some anthropologists who've kind of taken yeah. that approach back in the past, but our job is to understand. And so- so we don't, and it doesn't mean that, you know, I think one of the things, it doesn't mean that all anthropologists are atheists or all anthropologists are believers, or it doesn't really matter. And so that's what I tell my students. It doesn't matter what your personal convictions or lack thereof are. You can still be an anthropologist who studies religion because it doesn't, you I mean, that's just, you table all of that, right? So interest in what is true, what is real, that's, you know, that's, that's not really, those aren't the, I mean, those are questions for theologians or philosophers. They're not questions for anthropologists. Um, so that you're exactly right. So my job isn't to evaluate, oh, are these really spirit visits or are people, or is it just the wind or something, you know, I mean, that's not, those aren't the kinds of questions that I'm interested in. I'm not, I'm not interested in people's mental health state. I mean, that, I mean, in general, yes, of course, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not understand, but that, but that's not, those aren't the kinds of questions right. that we ask as anthropologists. We want to understand from the standpoint of people who are, are experiencing and living the religion. So, and we want, you know, and we're very interested in kind of everyday religion. Yeah, we're certainly interested in in this the the viewpoint of experts or religious leaders, but we're also maybe even more interested in the lay perspective, right? So, and that's what for lots of anthropo I mean, all of my grad students are studying religion in some fashion or another and everybody ends up having this issue when they start their field. I mean, everybody, I think, who studies religion as an anthropologist is you, you know, you you go to your field site, whether that's in northern Utah or East Africa or in, you know, in southern Japan or wherever. And at one point, every anthropologist who studies religion is going to be advised, let's say, by someone in the community that, oh, you really need to talk to the priest or the imam or the head of the shrine because they are the ones or the bishop. They're the ones who really know what's going on. If you just talk to these random people in the pews, who knows what they're going to tell you, right? They're just going to be all over the place. They're not going to give you the right, uh, the right understanding of the religion. And then as anthropologists, we come back like, no, but that's what I'm really interested in. I'm interested in, I'm interested in the everyday people. Like, what is Mormonism for just normal people in Cache mm -hmm. Valley or in North Carolina or wherever? So that's really what we want to explore and want to understand. Yeah, it's really helpful to talk to experts, of course, but that's a particular view and a particular way of being. So you have 
you know, and I didn't, I didn't, you know, well, I did interview some, I mean, I interviewed some missionaries and some with permission of their mission leader and when the seminary teacher, so people who, you know, are, are, are experts in a certain way um, and super beneficial, but we also want to talk to people who wouldn't necessarily, who don't, you know, necessarily have kind of a formal position in of leadership or a formal position of expertise, because that's 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 what we're really quite interested in. And in one of the the last chapter of the book where I talk about priesthood powers and casting out spirits, part of the part of the chapter focuses on, oh, this is a this is a big topic, gender and the priesthood, as you know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. but so one of the things I talk about is how, you know, how people discuss or kind of contest priesthood authority in a gendered framework when it comes to certain kinds of spiritual abilities. And so a lot of, you know, a lot of the, the I, I include interviews and some other kinds of materials where, where people are kind of reflecting on what they regard as kind of the true religion where women do have these spiritual powers and women, and they often refer back to the early history of the church when women mm -hmm. did, had these really, you know, very, were, were exercising very important yeah. spiritual powers. And so, I kind of end the book on looking at how people differentiate between, you know, kind of Utah culture, Mormon culture, the institutional body of the church, and then what they regard as the real religion or the true religion, which is, which is, um, which is, you know, and, and people kind of come down on, I don't know, maybe, maybe I shouldn't give too much away, but kind of come down on the same, you know, kind of looking at what they regard as the real religion as being quite different from maybe the institutional body of the church. Mm -hmm. Or Utah Mormon culture, which are all, yeah. you know, those kinds of three different, you have Utah Mormon culture here, you have the institutional body of the church here, and then over here you have what the religion is really about. So, um, and so, and people are often, you know, differentiate those in really fascinating and sophisticated ways, as I'm sure you've explored many times in different <laughs> ways in your, in your podcast. No, this is just great. This makes me so excited to read your book. And I think everybody else too, because you're absolutely right. The formal religion of Mormonism began with a spiritual visitation, right? Angel Moroni or Nephi, whichever it was, it's always up for debate. And then continued visitations that we just talk about as if it's nothing, right? I never really thought about it until I started teaching my kids Mormonism. And I had to say, yes, these three spirits, you know, they'd kind of look at me and I'd have to make it sound normal to them, you know, mm -hmm. but I think a lot of us, I think I laugh when I, the last time I visited my parents' home, the home where all the genealogy ghosts used to, mm -hmm. used to appear. And I was an adult, I was in my early fifties and I was going to go sleep in the den, which had been my mom's office. And I remember walking in there, you know, and I don't believe in this at all. But I was raised Mormon where, you know, riddled with spirit visits. And I just said, okay, you guys, I know you used to visit my mom and dad, but I, I'm not into that. I said it out loud. I said, so please don't, please don't come to me. I'm going to be visiting here for a couple of weeks. Please don't, you know, I just address them. So that tells me on some level, I'm just hardwired, you know, to have those things be sort of normalized to me through the religious experience and then just how it trickles down into individual people experiencing and living it. So yeah. I think this is great. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any other final thoughts, Landon? This has just been fascinating. And I just, I can't wait for this book to come out. No, I, I really appreciate it. We have some ghosts in the, in the camera. In fact, I don't know if you noticed, but when you were talking about witchcraft, your camera turned green, everything turned green. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't see that. Did you not see it? Oh, it no, happened on my screen. That? So yeah. yeah. <laughs> I saw that too. That's never happened before. Never. So I've never had my okay. campus in green before. So I know whoever's here, you're welcome. Got, the are the there witches are there. Standing behind me. I don't see anybody. <laughs> is that Kane? I don't know. Yeah. Wow. Well, this has been an amazing conversation and the book is going to be out on February 16th. We will link some information in the show notes. We will also link some information to some of your other articles that you discussed in other ways that we can access some of the things that you were talking about for our viewers. And please leave us comments. Let us know. Have you had any of these experiences? Have you had relatives that had? What do you think about this sort of pervasiveness in Mormonism and, and these spiritual visitations? And, and what role have these played in your life? So we'd love to hear from you. So uh, please like and subscribe to Mormonish. And if you'd like to be made aware of when new episodes come out, you can hit that notification bell. If you would like to financially support Mormonish podcast, we always have links in the show notes to PayPal and Venmo. And we really appreciate all of you that, that do support us. We just, we couldn't do it without all of you. And we'd say thank you again to Aaron. This was just 
fascinating. And we will be hearing more about this book as it gets closer um, to coming out next month. So thank you so much, Erin. Thank you for spending the morning with us. We really appreciate it. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's really been an honor and I've loved talking to both of you. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you thank so much. You. And thanks again, Landon. And we'll see you all next time on Mormonish Podcast. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mormonish. We really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share. You can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.